Section zero of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zishan Reshamwala. Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. Introductory Memoir by Edmund W. Goss. If Toru Dutt were alive, she would still be younger than any recognized european writer and yet her fame which is already considerable has been entirely posthumous within the brief space of four years which now divides us from the date of her decease her genius has been revealed to the world under many phases and has been recognized throughout france and england her name at least is no longer unfamiliar in the ear of any well-read man or woman but at the hour of her death she had published but one book and that book had found but two reviewers in europe one of these monsieur andre Thurier, the well-known poet and novelist gave the sheaf gleaned in french fields adequate praise in the revue de du monde but the other the writer of the present notice has a melancholy satisfaction in having been a little earlier still in sounding the only note of welcome which reached the dying poetess from england it was while professor minto was editor of the examiner that one day in august eighteen seventy six in the very heart of the dead season for books i happened to be in the office of that newspaper and was upbraiding the whole body of publishers for issuing no books worth reviewing at that moment the postman brought in a thin and sallow packet with a wonderful indian postmark on it and containing a most unattractive orange pamphlet of verse printed at bhawanipur and entitled a sheaf gleaned in french fields by toru dutt this shabby little book of some two hundred pages without preface or introduction seemed specially destined by its particular providence to find its way hastily into the waste-paper basket i remember that mr minto thrust it into my unwilling hands and said there see whether you can't make something of that a hopeless volume it seemed with its queer type published at bhawanipur printed at the saptahik sambad press but when at last i took it out of my pocket what was my surprise and almost rapture to open at such verse as this still barred thy doors the far east close the morning wind blows fresh and free should not the hour that wakes the rose awaken also thee all look for thee love light and song light in the sky deep red above song in the lark of pinion strong and in my heart true love apart we miss our nature's goal why strive to cheat our destinies was not love made for thy soul thy beauty for mine eyes no longer sleep o oh, listen now i wait and weep but where art thou when poetry is as good as this it does not much matter whether rouvier prints it upon whatman paper or whether it steals to light in blurred type from some press in bhawanipur toru dutt was the youngest of the three children of a high caste hindu couple in bengal her father who survives them all the babu govind chanda dutt is himself distinguished among his countrymen for the width of his views and the vigour of his intelligence his only son abju died in eighteen sixty five at the age of fourteen and left his two younger sisters to console their parents aru the elder daughter born in eighteen fifty four was eighteen months senior to toru the subject of this memoir who was born in calcutta on the fourth of march eighteen fifty six with the exception of one year's visit to bombay the childhood of these girls was spent in calcutta at their father's garden house in a poem now printed for the first time toru refers to the scene of her earliest memories the circling wilderness of foliage the shining tank with the round leaves of the lilies the murmuring dusk under the vast branches of the central casuarina tree 
here in a mystical retirement more irksome to an european in fancy than to an oriental in reality the brain of this wonderful child was moulded she was pure hindu full of the typical qualities of her race and blood and as the present volume shows us for the first time preserving to the last her appreciation of the poetic side of her ancient religion though faith itself in vishnu and shiva had been cast aside with childish things and been replaced by a purer faith her mother fed her imagination with the old songs and legends of their people stories which it was the last labour of her life to weave into english verse but it would seem that the marvellous faculties of toru's mind still slumbered when in her thirteenth year her father decided to take his daughters to europe to learn english and french to the end of her days toru was a better french than english scholar she loved france best she knew its literature best she wrote its language with more perfect elegance the dutz arrived in europe at the close of eighteen sixty nine and the girls went to school for the first and last time at a french pension they did not remain there very many months their father took them to italy and england with him and finally they attended for a very short time but with great zeal and application the lectures for women at cambridge in november eighteen seventy three they went back again to bengal and the four remaining years of toru's life were spent in the old garden house at calcutta in a feverish dream of intellectual effort and imaginative production when we consider what she achieved in these forty-five months of seclusion it is impossible to wonder that the frail and hectic body succumbed under so excessive a strain she brought with her from europe a store of knowledge that would have sufficed to make an english or french girl seem learned but which in her case was simply miraculous immediately upon her return she began to study sanskrit with the same intense application which she gave to all her work and mastering the language with extraordinary swiftness she plunged into its mysterious literature but she was born to write and despairing of an audience in her own language she began to adopt ours as a medium for her thought her first essay published when she was eighteen was a monograph published in the bengal magazine on le comte de lille a writer with whom she had a sympathy which is very easy to comprehend the austere poet of la mort de valmiki was obviously a figure to whom the poet of sindhu must needs be attracted on approaching european literature this study which was illustrated by translations into english verse was followed by another on josephin soulary in whom she saw more than her maturer judgment might have justified there is something very interesting and now alas still more pathetic in these sturdy and workmanlike essays in unaided criticism still more solitary her work became in july eighteen seventy four when her only sister aru died at the age of twenty she seems to have been no less amiable than her sister and if gifted with less originality and a less forcible ambition to have been finely accomplished both sisters were well-trained musicians with full contralto voices and aru had a faculty for design which promised well the romance of mademoiselle Daré was originally projected for aru to illustrate but no page of this book did aru ever see in eighteen seventy six as we have said appeared that obscure first volume at bhawanipur the sheaf gleaned in french fields is certainly the most imperfect of toru's writings but it is not the least interesting it is a wonderful mixture of strength and weakness of genius overriding great obstacles and of talent succumbing to ignorance and inexperience that it should have been performed at all is so extraordinary that we forget to be surprised at its inequality the english verse is sometimes exquisite at other times the rules of our prosody are absolutely ignored and it is obvious that the hindu poetess was chanting to herself a music that is discord in an english ear the notes are no less curious and to a stranger no less bewildering nothing could be more naive than the writer's ignorance at some points or more startling than her learning at others 
on the whole the attainment of the book was simply astounding it consisted of a selection of translations from nearly one hundred french poets chosen by the poetess herself on a principle of her own which gradually dawned upon the careful reader she eschewed the classicist writers as though they had never existed for her andre chenier was the next name in chronological order after dubarta occasionally she showed a profundity of research that would have done no discredit to mr sainsbury or le du assez you know she was ready to pronounce an opinion on napole le pyrenean or to detect plagiarism in baudelaire but she thought that alexander smith was still alive and she was curiously vague about the career of saint beuve this inequality of equipment was a thing inevitable to her isolation and hardly worth recording except to show how laborious her mind was and how quick to make the best of small resources we have already seen that the sheep gleaned in french fields attracted the very minimum of attention in england in france it was talked about a little more monsieur garcin de tassy the famous orientalist who scarcely survived toru by twelve months spoke of it to mademoiselle clarisse badet author of a somewhat remarkable book on the position of women in ancient indian society almost simultaneously this volume fell into the hands of toru and she was moved to translate it into english for the use of hindus less instructed than herself in january eighteen seventy seven she accordingly wrote to mademoiselle badet requesting her authorization and received a prompt and kind reply on the eighteenth of march toru wrote again to this her solitary correspondent in the world of european literature and her letter which has been preserved shows that she had already descended into the valley of the shadow of death ma constitution n'est pas forte j'ai contracté une tu opiniâtre il y a plus de deux ans qui ne me quittait point cependant j'espère mettre la main à l'œuvre bientôt je ne peux dire mademoiselle combien votre affection car vous les aimez votre livre et votre lettre en témoignent assez pour mes compatriotes et mon pays me touchent et je suis fier de pouvoir le dire que les héroïnes de nos grandes épopées sont dignes de tout honneur et de tout amour y a-t-il d'héroïnes plus touchantes plus aimables que sita je ne le crois pas quand j'entends ma mère chanter le soir le vieux chant de notre pays je pleure presque toujours la plante cita quand bannée pour la seconde fois elle erre dans la vaste forêt seule le désespoir et l'effroi dans l'âme est si pathétique qu'il n'y a personne je crois qui puisse l'entendre sans verser des larmes je vous envoie sous ce pli deux petites traductions du sanskrit cette belle langue antique malheureusement j'ai été obligé de faire cesser mes traductions de sanskrit il y a six mois ma santé ne me permet pas de les continuer these simple and pathetic words in which the dying poetess pours out her heart to the one friend she had and that one gained too late seem as touching and as beautiful as any strain of marceline valmore's immortal verse in english poetry i do not remember anything that exactly parallels their resigned melancholy before the month of march was over toru had taken to her bed unable to write she continued to read strewing her sick-room with the latest european books and entering with interest into the questions raised by the société asiatique of paris in its printed transactions on the thirtieth of january she wrote her last letter to mademoiselle clarisse Padet, and a month later on the thirtieth of august eighteen seventy seven at the age of twenty-one years six months and twenty-six days she breathed her last in her father's house in Maniktola Street, Calcutta.
in the first distraction of grief it seemed as though her unequalled promise had been entirely blighted and as though she would be remembered only by her single book but as her father examined her papers one completed work after another revealed itself first a selection from the sonnets of the comte de Ramon, translated into english turned up and was printed in a calcutta magazine then some fragments of an english story which were printed in another calcutta magazine much more important however than any of these was a complete romance written in french being the identical story for which her sister aru had proposed to make the illustrations in the meantime toru was no sooner dead than she began to be famous in may eighteen seventy eight there appeared a second edition of the sheep gleaned in french fields with a touching sketch of her death by her father and in eighteen seventy nine was published under the editorial care of mademoiselle clarisse badet the romance of le journal de mademoiselle davet forming a handsome volume of two hundred and fifty nine pages this book begun as it appears before the family returned from europe and finished nobody knows when is an attempt to describe scenes from modern french society but it is less interesting as an experiment of the fancy than as a revelation of the mind of a young hindu woman of genius the story is simple clearly told and interesting the studies of character have nothing french about them but they are full of vigour and originality the description of the hero is most characteristically indian il est beau en effet sa taille est haute mais quelques-uns la trouveraient mince sa chevelure noire est bouclée et tombe jusqu'à la nuque ses yeux noirs sont profonds et bien fendus le front est noble la lèvre supérieure couverte par une moustache naissante et noire est parfaitement modelée son menton a quelque chose de sévère son teint est d'un blanc presque féminin ce qui dénote sa haute naissance in this description we seem to recognize some surya or soma of hindu mythology and the final touch meaningless as applied to an european reminds us that in india whiteness of skin has always been a sign of aristocratic birth from the days when it originally distinguished the conquering arias from the indigenous race of the dasyus as a literary composition mademoiselle darvet deserves high commendation it deals with the ungovernable passion of two brothers for one placid and beautiful girl a passion which leads to fratricide and madness that it is a very melancholy and tragical story is obvious from this brief sketch of its contents but it is remarkable for coherence and self-restraint no less than for vigour of treatment toru dutt never sings to melodrama in the course of her extraordinary tale and the wonder is that she is not more often fantastic and unreal but we believe that the original english poems which we present to the public for the first time to-day will be ultimately found to constitute toru's chief legacy to posterity these ballads form the last and most matured of her writings and were left so far fragmentary at her death that the fourth and fifth in her projected series of nine were not to be discovered in any form among her papers it is probable that she had not even commenced them her father therefore to give a certain continuity to the series has filled up these blanks with two stories from the vishnu puran which originally appeared respectively in the calcutta review and in the bengal magazine these are interesting but a little rude in form and they have not the same peculiar value as the rhymed octosyllabic ballads in these last we see toru no longer attempting vainly though heroically to compete with european literature on its own ground but turning to the legends of her own race and country for inspiration no modern oriental has given us so strange an insight into the conscience of the asiatic as is presented in the stories of prahlad and of savitri or so quaint a piece of religious fancy as the ballad of jogadhya uma the poetess seems in these verses to be chanting to herself those songs of her mother's race 
to which she always turned with tears of pleasure they breathe a vedic solemnity and simplicity of temper and are singularly devoid of that littleness and frivolity which seem if we may judge by a slight experience to be the bane of modern india as to the merely technical character of these poems it may be suggested that in spite of much in them that is rough and inchoate they show that toru was advancing in her mastery of english verse such a stanza as this selected out of many no less skilful could hardly be recognized as the work of one by whom the language was a late acquirement what glorious trees the sombre soul on which the eye delights to rest the beetle nut a pillar tall with feathery branches for a crest the light-leaved tamarind spreading wide the pale faint-scented bitter neem the simul gorgeous as a bride with flowers that have the ruby's gleam in other passages of course the text reads like a translation from some stirring ballad and we feel that it gives but a faint and discordant echo of the music welling in toru's brain for it must frankly be confessed that in the brief mayday of her existence she had not time to master our language as blanco white did or as chamiso mastered german to the end of her days fluent and graceful as she was she was not entirely conversant with english especially with the colloquial turns of modern speech often a very fine thought is spoiled for hypercritical ears by the queer turn of expression which she has innocently given to it these faults are found to a much smaller degree in her miscellaneous poems her sonnets here printed for the first time seem to me to be of great beauty and her longer piece entitled our casuarina tree needs no apology for its rich and mellifluous numbers it is difficult to exaggerate when we try to estimate what we have lost in the premature death of torudat literature has no honours which need have been beyond the grasp of a girl who at the age of twenty-one and in languages separated from her own by so deep a chasm had produced so much of lasting worth and her courage and fortitude were worthy of her intelligence among last words of celebrated people that which her father has recorded it is only the physical pain that makes me cry is not the least remarkable or the least significant of strong character it was to a native of our island and to one ten years senior to toru to whom it was said in words more appropriate surely to her than to oldham thy generous fruits though gathered ere their prime still showed a quickness and maturing time but mellows what we write to the dull sweets of rhyme that mellow sweetness was all that toru lacked to perfect her as an english poet and of no other oriental who has ever lived can the same be said when the history of the literature of our country comes to be written there is sure to be a page in it dedicated to this fragile exotic blossom of song edmund w goss end of section zero recording by zishan reshamwala section one of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dat this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zishan Reshamwala. Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. Savitri, Part 1. Savitri was the only child of Madra's wise and mighty king. Stern warriors, when they saw her, smiled as mountains smile to see the spring fair as a lotus when the moon kisses its opening petals red after sweet showers in sultry june with happier heart and lighter tread 
chance strangers having met her passed and often would they turn the head a lingering second look to cast and bless the vision ere it fled what was her own peculiar charm the soft black eyes the raven hair the curving neck the rounded arm all these are common everywhere her charm was this upon her face childlike and innocent and fair no man with thought impure or base could ever look the glory there the sweet simplicity and grace abashed the boldest but the good god's purity there loved to trace mirrored in dawning womanhood in those far-off primeval days fair india's daughters were not bent in closed zananas on her ways savitri at her pleasure went whither she chose and hour by hour with young companions of her age she roamed the woods for fruit or flower or loitered in some hermitage for to the munis grey and old her presence was as sunshine clad they taught her wonders manifold and gave her of the best they had her father let her have her way in all things whether high or low he feared no harm he knew no ill could touch a nature pure as snow long childless as a priceless boon he had obtained this child at last by prayers made morning night and noon with many a vigil many a fast would shiva his own gift recall or mar its perfect beauty ever no he had faith he gave her all she wished and feared and doubted never and so she wandered where she pleased in boyish freedom happy time no small vexations ever teased nor crushing sorrows dimmed her prime one care alone her father felt where should he find a fitting mate for one so pure his thoughts long dwelt on this as with his queen he sate ah whom dear wife should we select leave it to god she answering cried savitri may herself elect some day her future lord and guide months passed and lo one summer morn as to the hermitage she went through smiling fields of waving corn she saw some youths on sport intent sons of the hermits and their peers and one among them tall and lithe royal in port on whom the years consenting shed a grace so blithe so frank and noble that the eye was loath to quit that sun-brown face she looked and looked then gave a sigh and slackened suddenly her pace what was the meaning was it love love at first sight as poets sing is then no fiction heaven above is witness that the heart its king finds often like a lightning flash we play we jest we have no care when hark a step there comes no crash but life or silent slow despair their eyes just met savitri passed into the friendly muni's hut her heart rose opened had at last opened no flower can ever shut in converse with the grey-haired sage she learnt the story of the youth his name and place and parentage of royal race he was in truth satyavan was he hight his sire dumat sen had been salva's king but old and blind opponents dire had gathered round him in a ring and snatched the sceptre from his hand now with his queen and only son he lived a hermit in the land and gentler hermit was there none with many tears was said and heard the story and with praise sincere of prince satyavan every word sent up a flush on cheek and ear unnoticed hark the bells remind tis time to go she went away
leaving her virgin heart behind and richer for the loss a ray shot down from heaven appeared to tinge all objects with supernal light the thatches had a rainbow fringe the cornfields looked more green and bright savitri's first care was to tell her mother all her feelings knew the queen her own fears to dispel to the king's private chamber flew now what is it my gentle queen that makes thee hurry in this wise she told him smiles and tears between all she had heard the king with sighs sadly replied i fear me much whence is his race and what his creed not knowing aught can we in such a delicate matter proceed as if the king's doubts to allay came narad muni to the place a few days after old and grey all loved to see the gossip's face great brahma's son adored of men long absent doubly welcome he unto the monarch hoping then by his assistance clear to see no god in heaven nor king on earth but narad knew his history the sun's the moon's the planet's birth was not to him a mystery now welcome welcome dear old friend all hail and welcome once again the greeting had not reached its end when glided like a music strain savitri's presence through the room and who is this bright creature say whose radiance lights the chamber's gloom is she an apsara or fay no son thy servant hath alas this is my one my only child and married no the seasons pass make haste o king he said and smiled that is the very theme o sage in which thy wisdom ripe i need seen hath she at the hermitage a youth to whom in very deed her heart inclines and who is he my daughter tell his name and race speak as to men who best love thee she turned to them her modest face and answered quietly and clear ah no ah no it cannot be choose out another husband dear the muni cried oh woe is me and why should i when i have given my heart away though but in thought can i take it back forbid it heaven it were a deadly sin i wot and why should i i know no crime in him or his believe me child my reasons shall be clear in time i speak not like a madman wild trust me in this i cannot break a plighted faith i cannot bear a wounded conscience oh forsake this fancy hence may spring despair it may not be the father heard by turns the speakers and in doubt thus interposed a gentle word friend should to friend his mind speak out is he not worthy tell us nay all worthiness is in satyavan and no one can my praise gainsay of solar race more god than man great surasen his ancestor and diomatsen his father blind are known to fame i can aver no kings have been so good and kind then where o muni is the bar if wealth be gone and kingdom lost his merit still remains a star nor melts his lineage like the frost for riches worldly power or rank i care not i would have my son pure wise and brave the fates i thank i see no hindrance no not one since thou insistest king to hear the fatal truth i tell you i upon this day as rounds the year the young prince satyavan shall die this was enough the monarch knew the future was no sealed book to brahma's son a clammy dew spread on his brow he gently took savitri's palm in his and said no child can give away her hand a pledge is not unsanctioned and here 
if right i understand there was no pledge at all a thought a shadow barely crossed the mind unblamed it may be clean forgot before the gods it cannot bind and think upon the dreadful curse of widowhood the vigils fasts and penances no life is worse than hopeless life the while it lasts day follows day in one long round monotonous and blank and drear less painful were it to be bound on some bleak rock for i to hear without one chance of getting free the ocean's melancholy voice mine be the sin if sin there be but thou must make a different choice in the meek grace of virginhood unblanched her cheek undimmed her eye savitri like a statue stood somewhat austere was her reply once and once only all submit to destiny tis god's command once and once only so tis writ shall woman pledge her faith and hand once and once only can a sire unto his well-loved daughter say in the presence of the witness fire i give thee to this man away once and once only have i given my heart and faith his past recall with conscience none have ever striven and none may strive without a fall not the less solemn was my vow because unheard and oh the sin will not be less if i should now deny the feeling felt within unwedded to my dying day i must my father dear remain tis well if so thou wilt but say can man balk fate or break its chain if fate so rules that i should feel the miseries of a widow's life can man's device the doom repeal unequal seems to be a strife between humanity and fate none have on earth what they desire death comes to all or soon or late and peace is but a wandering fire expediency leads wild astray the right must be our guiding star duty our watchword come what may judge for me friends as wiser far she said and meekly looked to both the father though he patient heard to give the sanction still seemed loath but narad muni took the word bless thee my child tis not for us to question the almighty will though cloud on cloud loom ominous in gentle rain they may distil at this the monarch be it so i sanction what my friend approves all praise to him whom praise we owe my child shall wed the youth she loves End of section one. Recording by Zishan Reshamwala. Section two of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This section has been read by Rosling Carlyle. Savitri Part Two. Great joy in Madra blow the shell, the marriage over to declare, and now to forest shades where dwell the hermits wend the wedded pair. The doors of every house are hung with gay festoons of leaves and flowers, and blazing banners broad are flung, and trumpets blown from castle towers slow the procession makes its ground along the crowded city street and blessings in a storm of sound at every step the couple greet 
past all the houses, past the wall, past gardens gay and hedgerows trim, past fields where sinuous brooklets small with molten silver to the brim glance in the sun's expiring light, past frowning hills, past pastures wild, at last arises on the sight. Foliage on foliage densely piled, the woods primeval where reside the holy hermits henceforth here must live the fair and gentle bride but this thought brought with it no fear fear will her husband buy her still or weariness where all was new hark what a welcome from the hill there gathered are a hermit's few screaming the paycocks upward soar wondering the timid wild deer gaze and from Briarian fig trees hoar look down the monkeys in amaze as the procession moves along and now behold the bridegroom's sire with joy comes forth amid the throng what reverence his looks inspire blind with his partner by his side for them it was a hallowed time warmly they greet the modest bride with her dark eyes and front sublime one only grief they feel Shall she, who dwelt in palace halls before, dwell in their huts beneath the tree? Would not their hard life press her sore, the manual labour, and the want of comforts that her rank became? Valkala robes, meals poor and scant, all undermine the fragile frame. To see the bride, the hermit's wives and daughters gathered to the huts, women of pure and saintly lives and there beneath the betel nuts tall trees like pillars they admire her beauty and congratulate the parents that their heart's desire had thus accorded been by fate and satyavan their son had found in exile lone a fitting mate and gossips add good signs abound prosperity shall on her wait Good signs in features, limbs, and eyes, that old experience can discern, good signs on earth and in the skies, that it could read at every turn, and now with rice and gold all bless the bride and bridegroom, and they go happy in others' happiness, each to her home beneath the glow of the late risen moon that lines with silver all the ghost-like trees, sal's tamarisks and south sea pines and palms whose plumes wave in the breeze. False was the fear the parents felt. Savitri liked her new life much. Though in a lowly home she dwelt, her conduct as a wife was such as to illumine all the place. She sickened not, nor sighed, nor pined, but with simplicity and grace, discharged each household duty kind, strong in all manual work, and strong to comfort, cherish, help and pray, the hours passed peacefully along, and rippling bright, day followed day. At morn sat Yavan to the wood, early repaired and gathered flowers and fruits, in its wild solitude and fuel, till advancing hours apprised him that his frugal meal awaited him, ah, happy time! Savitri, who with fervid zeal had said her orisons sublime, and fed the Brahmins and the birds, now ministered Arcadian love, with tender smiles and honey words, all bliss of earth thou art above. And yet there was a spectre grim, a skeleton in Savitri's heart, looming in shadow somewhat dim, but which would never thence depart. It was that fatal fatal speech of narad muni as the day slipped smoothly past each after each in private she more fervent prays but there is none to share her fears for how could she communicate the sad cause of her bidden tears the doom approached the fatal date no help from man well be it so no sympathy it matters not god can avert the heavy blow he answers worship, thus she thought, and so her prayers by day and night, like incense rose unto the throne, nor did she vow neglect, or right, the vils enjoin, or helpful own, upon the fourteenth of the moon, as nearer came the time of dread, in joystee, that is, May or June, she vowed her vows, and Brahmins fed. 
and now she counted e'en the hours as to eternity they passed o'er the head the dark cloud darker lowers the year is rounding full at last to-day to-day with doleful sound the words seemed in her ear to ring o oh, breaking heart thy pain profound thy husband knows not nor the king exiled and blind nor yet the queen but one knows in his place above to-day to-day it will be seen which shall be the victor death or love incessant in her prayers from morn the noon is safely tided then a gleam of faint faint hope is born but the heart fluttered like a wren that sees the shadow of the hawk sail on and trembles in affright lest a down-rushing swoop should mock its fortune and o'erwhelm it quite the afternoon has come and gone and brought no change should she rejoice the gentle evening's shades come on when hark she hears her husband's voice the twilight is most beautiful mother to gather fruit i go and fuel for the air is cool expect me in an hour or so the night my child draws on apace the mother's voice was heard to say the forest paths are hard to trace in darkness till the morrow stay not hard for me who can discern the forest paths in any hour blindfold i could with ease return and day has not yet lost its power he goes then thought savitri thus with unseen bands fate draws us on unto the place appointed us we feel no outward force and on we go to marriage or to death at a determined time and place we are her playthings with her breath she blows us where she lists in space what is my duty it is clear my husband i must follow so while he collects his forest gear let me permission get to go his sire she seeks the blind old king and asks from him permission straight my daughter night with ebon wing hovers above the hour is late my son is active brave and strong conversant with the woods he knows each path methinks it would be wrong for thee to venture where he goes weak and defenceless as thou art at such a time if thou wert near thou might embarrass him dear heart alone he would not have to fear so spake the hermit monarch blind his wife too entering in expressed the self-same thoughts in words as kind and begged savitri hard to rest thy recent fasts and vigils child make thee unfit to undertake this journey to the forest wild but nothing could her purpose shake she urged the nature of her vows she required her now the rites were done to follow where her loving spouse might e'en a chance of danger run go then my child we give thee leave but with thy husband quick return before the flickering shades of eve deepen to night and planets burn and forest paths become obscure lit only by their doubtful rays the gods who guard all women pure bless thee and kept thee in thy ways and safely bring thee and thy lord on this she left and swiftly ran where with his saw in lieu of sword and basket plodded satyavan o oh, lovely are the woods at dawn and lovely in the sultry noon but loveliest when the sun withdrawn the twilight and a crescent moon change all asperities of shape and tone all colours softly down with a blue veil of silvered crape lo by that hill which palm-trees crown down the deep glade with perfume rife from buds that to the dews expand the husband and the faithful wife past a dense jungle hand in hand satyavan bears beside the saw a forked stick to pluck the fruit his wife the basket lined with straw he talks but she is almost mute and very pale the minutes pass the basket has no further space now on the fruits they flowers mass that with their red flush all place while twilight lingers then for wood he saws the branches of the trees the noise heard in solitude grates on its soft low harmonies and all the while one dreadful thought haunted savitri's anxious mind which would have fain its stress forgot it came as chainless as the wind oft and again thus on the spot marked with his heart-blood oft comes back the murdered man to see the clot death's final blow the fatal rack of every hope 
whence will it fall for fall by narod's word it must persistent rising to appall this thought its horrid presence thrust sudden the noise is hushed a pause satyavan lets the weapon drop too well savitri knows the cause he feels not well the work must stop a pain is in his head a pain as if he felt the cobra's fangs he tries to look around in vain a mist before his vision hangs the trees whirl dizzily around in a fantastic fashion wild his throat and chest seem iron-bound he staggers like a ch sleepy child my head my head savitri dear this pain is frightful let me lie here on the turf her voice was clear and very calm was her reply as if her heart had banished fear lean love thy head upon my breast and as she helped him added here so shall thou better breathe and rest ah me this paint is getting dark i see no more can this be death what means this god civitry mark my hands wax cold and fails my breath it may be but a swoon ah no arrows are piercing through my heart farewell my love for i must go for this is death he gave one start and then lay quiet on her lap insensible to sight and sound breathing his last the branches flap and fireflies glimmer all around his head upon her breast his frame part on her lap part on the ground thus lies he hours pass still the same the pair look statues magic bound end of section two Section three of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This section has been read by Rosling Carlyle. Savitri Part three. Death in his palace holds his court. His messengers move to and fro each of his mission makes report and takes the royal orders low some slow before his throne appear and humbly in the presence kneel why hath the prince not been brought here the hour is past nor is appeal allowed against foregone decree there is the mandate with the seal how comes it ye return to me without him shame upon your zeal o oh, king whom all men fear he lies deep in the dark metiaf wood we fled from thence in wild surprise and left him in that solitude we dared not touch him for there sits beside him lighting all the place a woman fair whose brow permits in its austerity of gaze and purity no creatures foul as we seemed by her loveliness or soul of evil ghost or ghoul to venture close and far far less to stretch a hand and bear the dead we left her leaning on her hand thoughtful no teardrop had she shed but looked the goddess of the land with her meek air of mild command then on this errand i must go myself and bear my dreaded brand this duty unto fate i owe i know the merits of the prince but merit saves not from the doom common to man his death long since was destined in his beauty's bloom end of section three section four of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this section has been read by rosling carlyle savitri part four as still savitri sat beside her husband dying dying fast she saw a stranger slowly glide beneath the boughs that shrunk aghast upon his head he wore a crown that shimmered in the doubtful light his vestment scarlet reached low down his waist a golden girdle dight his skin was dark as bronze his face irradiate and yet severe his eyes had much of love and grace but glowed so bright they filled with fear 
A string was in the stranger's hand, noosed at its end. Her terrors now Savitri scarcely could command upon the sod beneath a bough. She gently laid her husband's head, and in obeisance bent her brow. No mortal form is thine, she said. Beseech thee, say what god art thou, and what can be thine errand here? Savitri, for thy prayers, thy faith, thy frequent vows, thy fast severe, I answer, list, my name is Death, and I am come myself to take thy husband from this earth away. And he shall cross the doleful lake in my own charge, and let me say, to few such honours I accord, but his pure life and thine require no less of me. The dreadful sword, like lightning, glanced one moment dire, and then the inner man was tied, the soul no bigger than the thumb. To be borne onwards by his side, Savitri all the while stood dumb. But when the god moved slowly on, to gain his own dominions dim, Leaving the body there anon, Savitri meekly followed him, hoping against all hope, he turned, and looked surprised. Go back, my child! Pale, pale, the stars above them burned, more weird the scene had grown, and wild. It is not for the living, here, to follow where the dead must go. Thy duty lies before thee clear, what thou shouldst do, the shasters show. The funeral rites that they ordain and sacrifices must take up. Thy first sad moment, not in vain, is held to thee this bitter cup. Its lessons thou shalt learn in time. All that thou canst do, thou hast done. For thy dear Lord, thy love sublime, my deepest sympathy hath won. Return, for thou hast come as far as living creature may. Adieu. Let duty be thy guiding star, as ever, to thyself, be true. Where'er my husband dear is led, or journeys of his own free will, I too must go. Though darkness spread across my path portending ill, tis thus my duty I have read, if I am wrong, oh, with me bear, do not bid me backward tread, my way forlorn, for I can dare all things but that, ah, pity me, a woman frail, too sorely tried, and let me, let me follow thee, O gracious God, whate'er betide. By all things sacred, I entreat, by penitence that purifies, by prompt obedience, full, complete, to spiritual masters in the eyes of God so precious by the love, I bear my husband by the faith that looks from earth to heaven above, and by thy own great name, O death, and all thy kindness bid me not to leave thee and to go my way. But let me follow, as I ought, thy steps and his, as best I may. I know that in this transient world all is delusion, nothing true. I know its shows are mists unfurled, to please and vanish, to renew. Its bubble joys be magic bound, in Maya's network frail and fair. Is not my aim the gladsome sound of husband, brother, friend, is heir to such as know that all must die, and that at last the time must come? When I shall speak no more to I, and love cry, Lo, this is my sum. I know in such a world as this no one can gain his heart's desire, Or pass the years in perfect bliss, like gold we must be tried by fire, And each shall suffer as he acts, and thinks, his own sad burden bear. No friends can help, his sins are facts that nothing can annul or square, And he must bear their consequence. Can I my husband save by rights? Ah, no, that were a vain pretense, justice eternal strict requites. He for his deeds shall get his due, and I for mine thus hear each soul, is its own friend fit pursue the right, and run straight for the goal. But its own worst and direst foe, if it chooses evil, and in tracks forbidden for its pleasure go. Who knows not this true wisdom lacks? Virtue should be the turn and end of every life, all else is vain. Duty should be its dearest friend, if higher life it would attain. So sweet thy words ring on mine ear, gentle Savitri, that I fain would give some sign to make it clear. Thou hast not prayed to me in vain. Satyavan's life I may not grant, nor take before its term thy life. But I am not all adamant, I feel for thee, thou faithful wife. Ask thou what else, and let it be, some good thing for thyself or thine. And I shall give it, child, to thee, if any power on earth be mine. 
Well be it so, my husband's sire hath lost his sight and fair domain. Give to his eyes their former fire, and place him on his throne again. It shall be done. Go back, my child. The hour wears late, the wind feels cold, the path becomes more weird and wild. Thy feet are torn, there's blood, behold! Thou feelest faint from weariness. Oh, try to follow me no more. Go home, and with thy presence bless those who thine absence there deplore. No weariness, O oh death, I feel. And how should I, when by the side of Satyavan, in woe and weal to be a helpmate swears the bride? This is my place, by solemn oath. Wherever thou conductest him, I too must go, to keep my troth. And if the eye at times should brim, tis human weakness, give me strength, my work appointed to fulfil, that I may gain the crown at length. The gods give those who do their will. The power of goodness is so great, we pray to feel its influence, forever on us it is late, and the strange landscape awes my senses. But I would fain with thee go on, and hear thy voice so true and kind, the false lights that on objects shown have vanished, and no longer blind, thanks to thy simple presence. Now I feel a fresher air around, and see the glory of that brow, with flashing rubies fitly crowned. Men call thee Yama, conqueror, because it is against their will they follow thee, and they abhor the truth which thou wouldst eye instill. If they thy nature knew all right, O oh, God, all other gods above, and that thou conquerest in the fight by patience, kindness, mercy, love, and not by devastating wrath, they would not shrink in childlike fright to see thy shadow on their path. But hail thee, as sick souls the light. Thy words, Savitri, greet mine ear, as sweet as founts that murmur low, to one who in the desert's drear with parched tongue moves faint and slow, because thy talk is heart sincere, without hypocrisy or guile. Demand another boon, my dear, but not of those forbade erewhile, and I shall grant it, ere we part. Lo, the stars pale, the way is long, receive thy boon, and homeward start, for ah, poor child, thou art not strong. Another boon, my sire the king, beside myself, hath children none, O oh, grant that from his stock may spring a hundred boughs. It shall be done. He shall be blessed with many a son, who, his old palace, shall rejoice, each heart wish from thy goodness won. If I am still allowed a choice, I fain thy voice would ever hear. Reluctant am I still to part. The way seems short when thou art near, and Satyavan, my heart's dear heart. Of all the pleasures given on earth, the company of the good is best, for weariness has never birth in such a commerce sweet and blest. The sun runs on its wonted course, the earth its plenteous treasure yields, all for their sake and by the force their prayer united ever wields. Oh, let me, let me ever dwell amidst the good, where'er it be, whether in low hermit cell or in some spot beyond the sea, the favours man accords to men are never fruitless from them rise a thousand acts beyond our ken that float like incense to the skies, for benefits can ne'er efface, they multiply and widely spread, and honour follows on their trace, sharp penances and vigils dread, austerities and Wasting fasts create an empire, and the blessed, long as this spiritual empire lasts, become the saviours of the rest. O oh, thou endowed with every grace and every virtue, thou, whose soul appears upon thy lovely face, may the great gods who all control send thee their peace, I too would give one favour more before I go. Ask something for thyself, and live happy and dear to all below, till summoned to the bliss above. Savitri, ask, and ask unblamed. She took the clue, felt death was love, for no exceptions now he named, and boldly said, Thou knowest, Lord, the inmost hearts and thoughts of all. There is no need to utter word upon thy mercy soul I call. If speech be needful to obtain thy grace, O oh, here a wife forlorn, let my Satyavan live again and children unto us be born, wise, brave, and valiant. 
from thy stock a hundred families shall spring as lasting as the solid rock each son of thine shall be a king and thus he spoke he loosened the knot the soul of satyavan that bound and promised further that their lot in pleasant places should be found thenceforth and that they both should live for centuries to which the name of fair savitri men would give and then he vanished in a flame adieu great god she took the soul no bigger than the human thumb and running swift soon reached her goal where lay the body stark and dumb she lifted it with eager hands and as before when he expired she placed the head upon the bands that bound her breast which hope new fired and which alternate rose and fell then placed his soul upon his heart whence like a bee it found its cell and lo he woke with a sudden start his breath came low at first then deep with unquiet look he gazed as one awaking from a sleep wholly bewildered and amazed End of section four Section five of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. This section has been read by Roslyn Carlyle. Savitri Part five as consciousness came slowly back he recognized his loving wife who was it love through regions black where hardly seemed a sign of life carried me bound methinks i view the dark face yet a noble face he had a robe of scarlet hue and ruby crown far far through space he bore me on and on but now thou hast been sleeping but the man with glory on his kingly brow is gone thou seest satyavan o oh, my beloved thou art free sleep which had bound thee fast hath left thy eyelids try thyself to be for late of every sense bereft thou seemedst in a rigid trance and if thou canst my love arise regard the night the dark expanse spread out before us and the skies supported by her looked he long upon the landscape dim outspread and like some old remembered song the past came back a tangled thread i had a pain as if an asp gnawed in my brain and there i lay silent for oh i could but gasp till someone came that bore away my spirit into lands unknown thou dear how watchedst beside me say was it a dream from elfland blown or very truth my doubts to stay o oh, love look round how strange and dread the shadows of the high trees fall homeward our path now let us tread to-morrow i shall tell thee all arise be strong gird up thy loins think of our parents dearest friend the solemn darkness haste enjoins not likely is it soon to end hark jackals still at distance howl the day long long will not appear lo wild fierce eyes through bushes scowl summon thy courage lest i fear was that the tiger's sullen growl what means this rush of many feet can creatures wild so near us prowl rise up and hasten homeward sweet he rose but could not find the track and then too well savitri knew his wonted force had not come back she made a fire and from the dew essayed to shelter him at last he nearly was himself again then vividly rose all the past and with the past new fear and pain what anguish must my parents feel who wait for me the livelong hours their sore wound let us haste to heal before it festers past our powers for broken-hearted they may die o oh, hasten dear now i am strong no more i suffer let us fly ah me each minute seems so long they told me once they could not live without me in their feeble age their food and water i must give and help them in the last sad stage of earthly life and that beyond in which a son can help by rights 
Oh, what a love is theirs, how fond, Whom now despair perhaps benights. Infirm herself. My mother dear, now guides me, thinks the tottering feet of my blind father, for they hear, and hasten eagerly to meet our fancied steps. O oh, faithful wife, let us on wings fly back again, upon their safety hangs my life. He tried his feelings to restrain, but like some river swelling high, they swept their barriers weak and vain. Suddenly there burst a fearful cry, then followed tears, like autumn rain. Hush! Hark! A sweet voice rises clear, a voice of earnestness, intense. If I have worshipped thee in fear, and duly paid with reverence, the solemn sacrifices, hear, send consolation and thy peace, eternal to our parents dear, that their anxieties may cease. Oh, ever hath I loved thy truth, therefore on thee I dare to call. Help us this night, and them forsooth. Without thy help we perish all. She took in hers Satyavan's hand. She gently wiped his falling tears. This weakness, love, I understand. Courage, she smiled away his fears. Now we shall go, for thou art strong. She helped him rise up by her side, and led him like a child along. He wistfully the basket eyed, laden with fruit and flowers. No, now. Tomorrow we shall fetch it hence. And so she hung it on a bough. I'll bear thy saw for our defence. In one fair hand the saw she took, the other, with a charming grace, she twined around him, and her look, she turned it upwards to his face. Thus aiding him, she felt anew, his bosom beat against her own, more firm his step, more clear his view, more self-possessed his words and tone, became as swift the minutes passed, and now the pathway he discerns, and neath the trees they hurry fast, for hope's fair light before them burns. Under the faint beams of the stars, how beautiful appeared the flowers, light scarlet, flecked with golden bars, of the palaces in the bowers, that nature there herself had made, without the aid of man. At times trees on their path cast densest shade, and nightingales sang mystic rhymes, their fears and sorrows to assuage, where two paths met the north they chose, as leading to the hermitage, and soon before them dim it rose. Here let us end, for all may guess, the blind old king received his sight, and ruled again with gentleness, the country that was his by right. And that Savitri's royal sire was blessed with many sons, a race whom poets praised for martial fire, and every peaceful gift and grace. As for Savitri to this day, her name is named when couples wed, and to the bride the parents say, Be thou like her, in heart and head. End of section 5「Section 6 of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. Lakshman Hark, Lakshman, hark, again that cry. It is, it is my husband's voice. O oh, hasten, to his succor fly. No more hast thou, dear friend, a choice. He calls on thee, perhaps his foes environ him on all sides round. That wail, it means death's final throes. Why standest thou, as magic bound? Is this a time for thought? O oh, gird thy bright sword on, and take thy bow. He heeds not, hears not any word. Evil hangs over us, I know. Swift in decision, prompt in deed, brave unto rashness, can this be the man to whom all looked at need? Is it my brother that I see? 
ah no and i must run alone for further here i cannot stay art thou transformed to blind dumb stone wherefore this impious strange delay that cry that cry it seems to ring still in my ears i cannot bear suspense if help we fail to bring his death at least we both can share o oh, calm thyself vidaean queen no cause is there for any fear hast thou his prowess never seen wipe off for shame that dastard tear what being of demonian birth could ever brave his mighty arm is there a creature on the earth that dares to work our hero harm the lion and the grizzly bear cower when they see his royal look sun-staring eagles of the air his glance of anger cannot brook pythons and cobras at his tread to their most secret coverts glide bowed to the dust each serpent head erect before in hooded pride rakshasas danavs demons ghosts acknowledge in their hearts his might and slink to their remotest coasts in terror at his very sight evil to him o oh, fear it not whatever foes against him rise banish for aye the foolish thought and be thyself bold great and wise he call for help canst thou believe he like a child would shriek for aid or pray for respite or reprieve not of such metal is he made delusive was that piercing cry some trick of magic by the foe he has a work he cannot die beseech me not from hence to go for here beside thee as a guard twas he commanded me to stay and dangers with my life to ward if they should come across thy way send me not hence for in this wood bands scattered of the giants lurk who on their wrongs and vengeance brood and wait the hour their will to work o oh, shame and canst thou make my weal a plea for lingering now i know what thou art lakshman and i feel far better were an open foe art thou a coward i have seen thy bearing in the battle fray where flew the death-fraught arrows keen else had i judged thee so to-day but then thy leader stood beside dazzles the cloud when shines the sun reft of his radiance see it glide a shapeless mass of vapours done so of thy courage or if not the matter is far darker dyed what makes thee loath to leave this spot is there a motive thou wouldst hide he perishes well let him die his wife henceforth shall be mine own can that thought deep embedded lie within thy heart's most secret zone search well and see one brother takes his kingdom one would take his wife a fair partition but it makes me shudder and abhor my life art thou in secret league with those who from his hope the kingdom rent a spy from his ignoble foes to track him in his banishment and wouldst thou at his death rejoice i know thou wouldst or sure ere now when first thou heardst that well-known voice thou shouldst have run to aid i trow learn this whatever comes may come 
but i shall not survive my love of all my thoughts here is the sum witness it gods in heaven above if fire can burn or water drown i follow him choose what thou wilt truth with its everlasting crown or falsehood treachery and guilt remain here with a vain pretense of shielding me from wrong and shame or go and die in his defence and leave behind a noble name choose what thou wilt i urge no more my pathway lies before me clear i did not know thy mind before i know thee now and have no fear she said and proudly from him turned was this the gentle sita no flames from her eyes shot forth and burned the tears therein had ceased to flow hear me o queen ere i depart no longer can i bear thy words they lacerate my inmost heart and torture me like poisoned swords have i deserved this at thine hand of lifelong loyalty and truth is this the meed i understand thy feelings sita and in sooth i blame thee not but thou mightst be less rash in judgment look i go little i care what comes to me wert thou but safe god keep thee so in going hence i disregard the plainest orders of my chief a deed for me a soldier hard and deeply painful but thy grief and language wild and wrong allow no other course mine be the crime and mine alone but oh do thou think better of me from this time here with an arrow lo i trace a magic circle ere i leave no evil thing within this space may come to harm thee or to grieve step not for aught across the line whatever thou mayst see or hear so shalt thou balk the bad design of every enemy i fear and now farewell what thou hast said though it has broken quite my heart so that i wish that i were dead i would before o queen we part freely forgive for well i know that grief and fear have made thee wild we part as friends is it not so and speaking thus he sadly smiled and o oh, ye sylvan gods that dwell among these dim and sombre shades whose voices in the breezes swell and blend with noises of cascades watch over sita whom alone i leave and keep her safe from harm till we return unto our own i and my brother arm in arm for though ill omens round us rise and frighten her dear heart i feel that he is safe beneath the skies his equal is not and his heel shall tread all adversaries down whoever they may chance to be farewell o sita blessings crown and peace for ever rest with thee he said and straight his weapons took his bow and arrows pointed keen kind nay indulgent was his look no trace of anger there was seen only a sorrow dark that seemed to deepen his resolve to dare all dangers hoarse the vulture screamed as out he strode with dauntless air End 
of section six section seven of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org this section has been read by Rosalind Carlyle. Jogadhya Uma Shell bracelets ho, shell bracelets ho, Fair maids and matrons, come and buy. Along the road in morning's glow The peddler raised his wanted cry. The road ran straight, a red, red line, To Kiragram, for cream renowned. Through pasture meadows where the kine in knee deep grass stood magic bound, and half awake involved in mist that floated in dun coils profound, till by the sudden sunbeams kissed, rich rainbow hues broke all around. Shell bracelets ho, shell bracelets ho, the roadside trees still dripped with dew and hung their blossoms like a show. Who heard the cry? "'Twas but a few, a ragged-haired boy here and there, "'with his long stick and naked feet, "'a ploughman wending to his care, "'the field from which he hopes the wheat, "'an early traveller hurrying fast to the next town, "'an urchin slow bound for the school. "'These heard and passed, unheeding all, "'shell bracelets ho! "'Pellucid spread a lake-like tank "'beside the road now lonelier still. High on three sides arose the bank, which fruit trees shadowed at their well. Upon the fourth side was the ghat, with its broad stairs of marble white, and at the entrance arch there sat, full face against the morning light, a fair young woman with large eyes and dark hair falling to her zone. She heard the peddler's cry arise, and eager seemed his wear to own. Shall bracelets ho! see maiden see the rich enamel sunbeam kissed happy oh happy shalt thou be let them but clasp that slender wrist these bracelets are a mighty charm they keep a lover ever true and widowhood avert and harm buy them and thou shalt never rue just try them on she stretched her hand oh what a nice and lovely fit no fairer hand in all the land and lo the bracelet matches it dazzled the peddler on her gazed till came the shadow of a fear while she the bracelet arm upraised against the sun to view more clear oh she was lovely but her look had something of a high command that filled with awe aside she shook intruding curls by breezes fanned and blown across her brows and face and asked the price which when she heard she nodded and with quiet grace for payment to her home referred and where o oh maiden is thy house but no that wrist ring has a tongue no maiden art thou but a spouse happy and rich and fair and young far otherwise my lord is poor and him at home thou shalt not find ask for my father at the door knock loudly he is deaf but kind seest thou that lofty gilded spire above these tufts of foliage green that is our place its point of fire will guide thee o'er the track between that is the temple spire yes there we live my father is the priest the manse is near a building fair but lonely to the temple's east when thou hast knocked and seen him say his daughter at dahamas ergat shall bracelets bought from thee to-day and he must pay so much for that be sure he will not let thee pass without the value and a meal if he demur or cry alas no money hath he then reveal within this small box marked with streaks of bright vermilion by the shrine the key whereof has lain for weeks untouched he'll find some coin tis mine that will enable him to pay the bracelet's price now fare thee well she spoke the peddler went away charmed with her voice as by some spell while she left lonely there prepared to plunge into the water pure and like a rose her beauty bared from all observance quite secure not weak she seemed nor delicate 
strong was each limb of flexile grace and full the bust the mien elate like hers the goddess of the chase on latmos hill and oh the face framed in its cloud of floating hair no painter's hand might hope to trace the beauty and the glory there well might the peddler look with awe for though her eyes were soft a ray lit them at times which kings who saw would never dare to disobey onwards through groves the peddler sped till full in front the sunlit spire arose before him paths which led to gardens trim and gay attire lay all around and lo the manse humble but neat with open door he paused and blessed the lucky chance that brought his bark to such a shore huge straw ricks log huts full of grain sleek cattle flowers a tinkling bell spoke in a language sweet and plain here smiling peace and plenty dwell unconsciously he raised his cry shell bracelets ho and at his voice looked out the priest with eager eye and made his heart at once rejoice ho sankha peddler pass not by but step thou in and share the food just offered on our altar high if thou art in a hungry mood welcome are all to this repast the rich and poor the high and low come wash thy feet and break thy fast then on thy journey strengthen to go oh thanks good priest observance due and greetings may thy name be blessed i came on business but i knew here might be had both food and rest without a charge for all the poor ten miles around thy sacred shrine know that thou keepest open door and praise that generous hand of thine but let my errand first be told for bracelets sold to thine this day so much thou owest me in gold hast thou the ready cash to pay the bracelets were enamelled so the price is high how sold to mine who bought them i should like to know thy daughter with the large black eyn now bathing at the marble cat loud laughed the priest at this reply i shall not put up friend with that no daughter in the world have i and only son is all my stay some minx has played a trick no doubt but cheer up let thy heart be gay be sure that i shall find her out nay nay good father such a face could not deceive i must aver at all events she knows thy place and if my father should demur to pay thee thus she said or cry he has no money tell him straight the box vermilion street to try that's near the shrine well wait friend wait the priest said thoughtful and he ran and with the open box came back here is the price exact my man no surplus over and no lack how strange how strange o oh, blessed art thou to have beheld her touched her hand before whom vishnu's self must bow and brahma and his heavenly band here have i worshipped her for years and never seen the vision bright vigils and fasts and secret tears have almost quenched my outward sight and yet that dazzling form and face i have not seen and thou dear friend to thee unsought for comes the grace what may its purport be and end how strange how strange o oh, happy thou and couldst thou ask no other boon than thy poor bracelet's price that brow resplendent as the autumn moon must have bewildered thee i trow and made thee lose thy senses all a dim light on the peddler now began to dawn and he let fall his bracelet basket in his haste and backward ran the way he came what meant the vision fair and chaste whose eyes were they those eyes of flame swift ran the peddler as a hind the old priest followed on his trace they reached the gat but could not find the lady of the noble face the birds were silent in the wood the lotus flowers exhaled a smell faint over all the solitude a heron as a sentinel stood by the bank they called in vain no answer came from the hill or fell the landscape lay in slumber's chain yin echo slept within her cell broad sunshine yet a hush profound they turned with saddened hearts to go then from afar there came a sound of silver bells the priest said low 
O oh, mother, mother, deign to hear, The worship hour has rung, We wait in meek humility and fear. Must we return home, desolate? O oh, come, as late thou camst unsought, Or was it but an idle dream? Give us some sign if it was not, A word, a breath, or passing gleam. Sudden from out the water sprung a rounded arm, On which they saw, as high the lotus buds among, It rose, the bracelet white with awe. Then a wide ripple tossed and swung, The blossoms on that liquid plain, And lo, the arm so young and fair, Sank in the waters down again. They bowed before the mystic power, And as they home returned in thought, Each took from thence a lotus flower, In memory of the day and spot. Years, centuries, have passed away, and still, before the temple shrine, descendants of the peddler pay, shell bracelets of the old design, as annual tribute. Much they own in lands and gold, but they confess, from that eventful day alone, dawned on their industry success. Absurd may be the tale I tell, ill-suited to the marching times. I love the lips from which it fell, so let it stand among my rhymes. End of section 7。section 8 of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt The Royal Ascetic and the Hind From the Vishnu Purana B. 2. Chapter 13 Maitreya Of old thou gavest a promise to relate The deeds of Bharat, that great hermit king. Beloved Master, now the occasion suits, and I am all attention. Parasara, Brahman, hear. With a mind fixed intently on his gods, long reigned in Saligram of ancient fame, the mighty monarch of the wide, wide world. Chief of the virtuous, never in his life harmed he or strove to harm his fellow man or any creature sentient but he left his kingdom in the forest shades to dwell and changed his sceptre for a hermit's staff and with ascetic rites privations rude and constant prayers endeavored to attain perfect dominion on his soul at morn fuel and flowers and fruit and holy grass he gathered for oblations and he passed in stern devotions all his other hours of the world heedless and its myriad cares and heedless too of wealth and love and fame once on a time while living thus he went to bathe where through the wood the river flows and his ablutions done he sat him down upon the shelving bank to muse and pray thither impelled by thirst a graceful hind big with its young came fearlessly to drink sudden while yet she drank the lion's roar feared by all creatures like a thunderclap burst in that solitude from a thicket nigh startled the hind leapt up and from her womb her offspring tumbled in the rushing stream whelmed by the hissing waves and carried far by the strong current swollen by recent rain the tiny thing still struggled for its life while its poor mother in her fright and pain fell down upon the bank and breathed her last up rose the hermit monarch at the sight full of keen anguish 
with his pilgrim staff he drew the newborn creature from the wave twas panting fast but life was in it still now as he saw its luckless mother dead he would not leave it in the woods alone but with the tenderest pity brought it home there in his leafy hut he gave it food and daily nourished it with patient care until it grew in stature and in strength and to the forest skirts could venture forth in search of sustenance at early morn thenceforth it used to leave the hermitage and with the shades of evening come again and in the little courtyard of the hut lie down in peace unless the tiger's fierce prowling about compelled it to return earlier at noon but whether near or far wandering abroad or resting in its home the monarch hermit's heart was with it still bound by affection's ties nor could he think of anything besides this little hind his nursling though a kingdom he had left and children and a host of loving friends almost without a tear the fount of love sprang out anew within his blighted heart to greet this dumb weak helpless foster-child and so whene'er it lingered in the wilds or at the customed hour could not return his thoughts went with it and alas he cried who knows perhaps some lion or some wolf or ravenous tiger with relentless jaws already hath devoured it timid thing lo how the earth is dented with its hoofs and variegated surely for my joy it was created when will it come back and rub its budding antlers on my arms in token of its love and deep delight to see my face the shaven stalks of grass kusha and kasha by its new teeth clipped remind me of it as they stand in lines like pious boys who chant the samga vades shorn by their vows of all their wealth of hair thus passed the monarch hermit's time in joy with smiles upon his lips whenever near his little favorite in bitter grief and fear and trouble when it wandered far and he who had abandoned ease and wealth and friends and dearest ties and kingly power found his devotions broken by the love he had bestowed upon a little hind thrown in his way by chance years glided on and death who spareth none approached at last the hermit king to summon him away the hind was at his side with tearful eyes watching his last sad moments like a child beside a father he too watched and watched his favorite through a blinding film of tears and could not think of the beyond at hand so keen he felt the parting such deep grief o'erwhelmed him for the creature he had reared to it devoted was his last last thought reckless of present and of future both thus far the pious chronicle writ of old by brahman sage but we who happier live under the holiest dispensation know that god is love and not to be adored by a devotion born of stoic pride or with ascetic rites or penance hard but with a love in character akin to his unselfish all-including love 
and therefore little can we sympathize with what the brahmin sage would fain imply as the concluding moral of his tale that for the hermit king it was a sin to love his nursling what a sin to love a sin to pity rather should we deem whatever brahmins wise or monks may hold that he had sinned in casting off all love by his retirement to the forest shades for that was to abandon duties high and like a recreant soldier leave the post where god had placed him as a sentinel this little hind brought strangely on his path this love engendered in his withered heart this hindrance to his rituals might these not have been ordained to teach him call him back to the ways marked out for him by love divine and with a mind less self-willed to adore not in seclusion not apart from all not in a place elected for its peace but in the heat and bustle of the world mid sorrow sickness suffering and sin must he still labor with a loving soul who strives to enter through the narrow gate end of section eight section nine of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anusha ayer mumbai ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt the legend of dhruva vishnu puran book one chapter eleven sprung from great brahma manu had two sons heroic and devout as i have said pravrata and uttanapado names known in legends and of these the last married two wives suruchi his adored the mother of a handsome petted boy uttama and suniti less beloved the mother of another son whose name was dhruva seated on his throne the king uttanapado on his knee one day had placed uttama dhruva who beheld his brother in that place of honour longed to clamber up and by his playmate sit led on by love he came but found alas scant welcome and encouragement the king saw fair suruchi sweep into the hall with stately step ay every inch a queen and dared not smile upon her co-wife's son observing him her rival's boy intent to mount ambitious to his father's knee where sat her own thus fair suruchi spake why hast thou child formed such a vain design why harboured such an aspiration proud born from another's womb and not from mine o oh, thoughtless to desire the loftiest place the throne of thrones a royal father's lap it is an honour to the destined given and not within thy reach what thou art born of the king those sleek and tender limbs hold of my blood no portion i am queen to be the equal of mine only son were in thee vain ambition knowest thou not fair prattler thou art sprung not not from mine but from suniti's bowels learn thy place repulsed in silence from his father's lap indignant furious at the words that fell from his stepmother's lips poor dhruva ran to his own mother's chambers where he stood beside her with his pale thin trembling lips trembling with an emotion ill suppressed and hair in wild disorder till she took and raised him to her lap and gently said o oh child what means this 
what can be the cause of this great anger who hath given thee pain he that hath vexed thee hath despised thy sire for in these veins thou hast the royal blood thus conjured dhruva with a swelling heart repeated to his mother every word that proud suruchi spake from first to last even in the very presence of the king his speech oft broken by his tears and sobs helpless suniti languid eyed from care heard sighing deeply and then soft replied o son to lowly fortune thou wert born and what my co-wife said to thee is truth no enemy to heaven's favoured ones may say such words as thy stepmother said to thee yet son it is not meet that thou shouldst grieve or vex thy soul the deeds that thou hast done the evil haply in some former life long long ago who may alas annul or who the good works not done supplement the sins of previous lives must bear their fruit the ivory throne the umbrella of gold the best steed in the royal elephant rich caparisoned must be his by right who has deserved them by his virtuous acts in times long past oh think on this my son and be content for glorious actions done not in this life but in some previous birth suruchi by the monarch is beloved women unfortunate like myself who bear only the name of wife without the powers but pine and suffer for our ancient sins suruchi raised her virtues pile on pile hence uttama her son the fortunate suniti heaped but evil hence her son dhruva the luckless but for all this child it is not meet that thou shouldst ever grieve as i have said that man is truly wise who is content with what he has and seeks nothing beyond but in whatever sphere lowly or great god placed him works in faith my son my son though proud suruchi spake harsh words indeed and hurt thee to the quick yet to thine eyes thy duty should be plain collect a large sum of the virtues thence a goodly harvest must to thee arise be meek devout and friendly full of love intent to do good to the human race and to all creatures sentient made of god and oh be humble for on modest worth descends prosperity even as water flows down to low grounds she finished and her son who patiently had listened thus replied mother thy words of consolation find no resting place nor echo in this heart broken by words severe repulsing love that timidly approached to worship hear my resolve unchangeable i shall try the highest good the loftiest place to win which the whole world deems priceless and desires there is a crown above my father's crown i shall obtain it and at any cost of toil or penance or unceasing prayer not born of proud surgery whom the king favours and loves but grown up from a germ in thee o mother humble as thou art i yet shall show thee what is in my power thou shalt behold my glory and rejoice let uttama my brother not thy son receive the throne and royal titles all my father pleases to confer on him i grudge them not not with another's gifts desire i dearest mother to be rich but with my own work would acquire a name and i shall strive unceasing for a place such as my father had not won a place that would not know him even i a place far far above the highest of this earth he said and from his mother's chambers passed and went into the wood where hermits live 
and never to his father's house returned well kept the boy his promise made that day by prayer and penance dhruva gained at last the highest heavens and there he shines a star nightly men see him in the firmament End of section 9 Recording by Anusha Ayer, Mumbai Section 10 of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Taro Dutt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Masters Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Taru Dutt Hotu Ho, oh, master of the wondrous art, instruct me in fair archery, and buy for a a grateful heart that will not grudge to give thy fee. Thus spoke a lad with kindling eyes, a hunter's low-born son was he, to Dronacharya great and wise who sat with princes round his knee. Up time's fair stream far back, oh far, the great wise teacher must be sought. The Kurus had not yet in war with the Pandava brethren fought. In peace at Dronacharya's feet, magic and archery they learned, a complex science which we meet no more with ages past inurned. And who art thou, the teacher said, my science brave to learn so fain? Which many kings who wear the thread have asked to learn of me in vain. My name is Butu, said the youth, a hunter's son, I know not fear. The teacher answered, smiling smooth, then know him from this time, my dear. Unseen the magic arrow came, amidst the laughter and the scorn of royal youths, like lightning flame sudden and sharp. They blew the horn, as down upon the ground he fell, not hurt, but made a jest and game. He rose and waved a proud farewell, but cheek and brow grew red with shame. And lo! A single, single tear dropped from his eyelash as he passed. My place, I gather, is not here, no matter what is rank or caste. In us is honour or disgrace, not out of us. Twas thus he mused. The question is, not wealth or place, but gifts well used or gifts abused. And I shall do my best to gain the science that man will not teach. For life is as a shadow vain until the utmost goal we reach to which the soul points. I shall try to realize my waking dream, and what if I should chance to die? None miss one bubble from a stream. So thinking, on and on he went, till he attained the forest's verge. The garish day was well nigh spent, birds had already raised its dirge. Oh, what a scene, how sweet and calm, it soothed at once his wounded pride, and on his spirit shed a balm that all its yearnings purified. What glorious trees! The sombre soul on which the eye delights to rest, the beetle-nut, a pillar tall, with feathery branches for a crest, the light-leaved tamarind spreading wide the pale faint scented bitter neem the simu gorgeous as a bride with flowers that have the ruby's gleam 
The Indian fig's pavilion tent In which whole armies might repose, With here and there a little rent The sunset's beauty to disclose. The bamboo boughs that sway and swing 'Neath bulbuls as the south wind blows. The mango tope, a close dark ring, Home of the rooks and clamorous crows. The champak, bok, and south sea pine, The nagasir with pendant flowers like earrings. And the forest vine that clinging over all embowers, The sirish famed in Sanskrit song Which rural maidens love to wear, The people, giant-like and strong, The bramble with its matted hair, all these and thousands, thousands more, With helmet red or golden crown or green tiara, Rose before the youth in evening's shadows brown. He passed into the forest. There new sights of wonder met his view, A waving pampas green and fair, All glistening with the evening dew. How vivid was the breast-high grass! Here waved in patches forest corn, Here intervened a deep morass, Here arid spots of verdure shorn lay open, Rock or barren sand, and here again The trees arose, thick clustering, A glorious band, their tops still bright With sunset glows. Stirred in the breeze the crowding boughs, And seemed to welcome him with signs, Onwards and on, Till Butu's brows are gemmed with pearls, And day declines. Then in a grassy open space He sits and leans against a tree, To let the wind blow on his face, And look around him leisurely. Herds and still herds of timid deer were feeding in the solitude. They knew not man and felt no fear and heeded not his neighborhood. Some young ones with large eyes and sweet came close and rubbed their foreheads smooth against his arms and licked his feet as if they wished his cares to soothe. They touch me, he exclaimed with joy, they have no pride of caste like men, they shrink not from the hunter boy, should not my home be with them then? Here in this forest let me dwell with these companions innocent, and learn each science and each spell all by myself in banishment. A calm, calm life, and it shall be its own exceeding great reward. No thoughts to vex in all I see, no jeers to bear or disregard. All creatures and inanimate things shall be my tutors. I shall learn from beast and fish and bird with wings and rock and stream and tree and fern. With this resolve he soon began to build a hut of reeds and leaves, and when that needful work was done, he gathered in his store the sheaves of forest corn, and all the fruit, date, plum, guava he could find, and every pleasant nut and root by providence for man designed. A statue next of earth he made, an image of the teacher wise. So deft he laid the light and shade on figure, forehead, face and eyes, that any one who chanced to view that image tall might soothly swear, if he great Dronacharya knew, the teacher in his flesh was there. Then at the statue's feet he placed a bow, and arrows tipped with steel, with wild flower garlands interlaced, and hailed the figure in his zeal as master, 
and his head he bowed a pupil reverent from that hour of one who late had disallowed the claim in pride of place and power by strained sense by constant prayer by steadfastness of heart and will by courage to confront and dare all obstacles he conquered still a conscience clear a ready hand joined to a meek humility success must everywhere command how could he fail who had all three and now by tests assured he knows his own god-gifted wondrous might nothing to any man he owes unaided he has won the fight equal to gods themselves above wishmo and drona for his worth his name he feels shall be with love reckoned with great names of the earth yet lacks he not in reverence to dranacharya who declined to teach him nay with e'en offence that well might wound a noble mind drove him away for in his heart meek placable and ever kind resentment had not any part and malice never was enshrined one evening on his work intent alone he practised archery when lo the bow proved false and sent the arrow from its mark or eye again he tried and failed again why was it hark a wild dog's bark an evil omen it was plain some evil on his path hung dark thus many times he tried and failed and still that lean persistent dog at distance like some spirit wailed safe in the cover of a fog his nerves unstrung with many a shout he strove to frighten it away it would not go but roamed about howling as wolves howl for their prey worried and almost in a rage one magic shaft at last he sent a sample of his science sage to quiet but the noises meant unerring to its goal it flew no death ensued no blood was dropped but by the hush the young man knew at last that howling noise had stopped it happened on this very day that the pandava princes came with all the kuru princes gay to beat the woods and hunt the game parted from others in the chase arjuna brave the wild dog found stuck still the shaft but not a trace of hurt though tongue and lip were bound wonder of wonders didst not thou o dronacharya promise me thy crown in time should deck my brow and i be first in archery lo here some other thou hast taught a magic spell to all unknown who has in secret from thee bought the knowledge in this arrow shown indignant thus arjuna spake to his great master when they met my word my honour is at stake judge not arjuna judge not yet come let us see the dog and straight they followed up the creature's trace they found it in the self-same state dumb yet unhurt near buto's place a hut a statue and a youth in the dim forest what mean these they gazed in wonder for in sooth the thing seemed full of mysteries now who art thou that dares to raise mine image in the wilderness is it for worship and for praise what is thine object speak confess o master unto thee i came to learn thy science 
Name or pelf I had not, so was driven with shame, And here I learn all by myself. But still as master thee revere, For who so great in archery? Lo, all my inspiration here, And all my knowledge is from thee. If I am master, now thou hast Finished thy course, give me my due. Let all the past be dead and past, Henceforth be ties between us new. All that I have, O master mine, All I shall conquer by my skill, Gladly shall I to thee resign. Let me but know thy gracious will. Is it a promise? Yea, I swear, so long as I have breath and life To give thee all thou wilt. Beware, rash promise ever ends in strife. Thou art my master, ask, O oh ask, From thee my inspiration came, Thou canst not set too hard a task, Nor aught refuse I, free from blame. If it be so, Arjuna, hear. Arjuna and the youth were dumb. For thy sake loud I ask and clear, Give me, O youth, thy right hand thumb. I promised in my faithfulness No equal ever shall there be to thee, Arjuna, And I press for this sad recompense for thee. Glanced the sharp knife one moment high, The severed thumb was on the sod, there was no tear in Butu's eye, he left the matter with his god. For this, said Dronacharya, fame shall sound thy praise from sea to sea, and men shall ever link thy name with self-help, truth, and modesty. End of section 10 Recording by Ken Masters Section 11 of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This has been read by Roslyn Carlyle Sindhu. Deep in the forest shades there dwelt a Muni and his wife. Blind, grey-haired, weak, they hourly felt their slender hold on life. No friends had they to help or stay except an only boy, a bright-eyed child, his laughter gay, their leaf hut filled with joy. Attentive, duteous, loving, kind, thoughtful, sedate, and calm. He waited on his parents blind, whose days were like a psalm. He roamed the woods for luscious fruits, he brought them water pure, he cooked their simple mess of roots, content to live obscure. To fretful questions, answers mild, he meekly ever gave. If they reproved, he only smiled, he loved to be their slave. Not that to him they were austere, but age is peevish still. Dear to their hearts he was, so dear that none his place might fill. They called him Sindhu, and his name was ever on their tongue, and he nor cared for wealth nor fame, who dwelt his own among. A belt of bela trees hemmed round, the cottage small and rude, if peace on earth was ever found, t'was in that solitude. Great Dasharat, the king of Oud, whom all men love and fear, with elephants and horses proud, went forth to hunt the deer. O oh, gallant was the long array, pennons and plumes were seen, and swords that mirrored back the day, and spears and axes keen. Rang trump and conch and piercing fife, woke echo from her bed, 
the solemn woods with sounds were rife as on the pageant sped hundreds nay thousands on they went the wild beasts fled away deer ran in herds and wild boars spent became an easy prey whirring the peacocks from the brake with argus wings arose wild swans abandoned pool and lake for climbs beyond the snows from tree to tree the monkeys sprung unharmed and unpursued as louder still the trumpets rung and startled all the wood the porcupines and such small game unnoted fled at will the weasel only caught to tame from fishers in the hill slunk light the tiger from the bank but sudden turned to bay when he beheld the serried rank that barred his tangled way uprooting fig trees on their path and trampling shrubs and flowers wild elephants in fear and wrath burst through like moving towers lowering their horns in crescents grim whene'er they turned about retreated into coverts dim the bison's fiercer rout and in this mimic game of war in bands dispersed and past the royal train some near some far as day closed in at last where was the king he left his friends at midday it was known and now the evening fasts descends where was he all alone curving the river formed a lake upon whose bank he stood no noise the silence there to break or mar the solitude upon the glassy surface fell the last beams of the day like fiery darts that lengthening swell as breezes wake and play osiers and willows on the edge and purple buds and red leant down and mid the pale green sedge the lotus raised its head and softly softly hour by hour light faded and a veil fell over tree and wave and flower on came the twilight pale deeper and deeper grew the shades stars glimmered in the sky the nightingale along the glades raised her preluding cry what is that momentary flash a gleam of silver scales reveals the mahasir then a splash and cam again prevails as darkness settled like a pall the eye would pierce in vain the fireflies gemmed the bushes all like fiery drops of rain pleased with the scene and knowing not which way alas to go the monarch lingered on the spot the lake spread bright below he lingered when oh hark oh hark what sound salutes his ear a roebuck drinking in the dark not hunted nor in fear straight to the stretch his bow he drew that bow ne'er missed its aim whizzing the deadly arrow flew ear guided on the game ah me what means this hark a cry a feeble human wail o oh god it said i die i die who'll carry home the pail startled the monarch forward ran and then there met his view a sight to freeze in any man the warm blood coursing true a child lay dying on the grass a pitcher by his side poor sindhu was the child alas his parents stay in pride his bow and quiver down to fling and lift the wounded boy a moment's work was with the king not dead that was a joy he placed the child's head on his lap and ranged the blinding hair the blood welled fearful from the gap on neck and bosom fair he dashed cold water on the face he chafed the hands with sighs till sense revived and he could trace expression in the eyes then mingled with his pity fear in all this universe what is so dreadful as to hear a brahmin's dying curse so thought the king and on his brow the beads of anguish spread and seen to fully conscious now the anguish plainly read 
What dost thou fear, O mighty king? For sure a king thou art. Why should thy bosom anguish ring? No crime was in thy heart. Unwittingly the deed was done. It is my destiny. O oh, fear not thou, but pity one, Whose fate is thus to die. No curses, no, I bear no grudge, Not thou my blood hast spilt. Lo, here before the unseen judge, Thee I absolve from guilt. The iron, red-hot as it burns, Burns those that touch it too. Not such my nature, for it spurns. Thank God the like to do. Because I suffer, should I give Thee, king, a needless pain? And no, I die, but mayst thou live, And cleansed from every stain. Struck with these words, and doubly grieved At what his hands had done, The monarch wept, as weeps bereaved A man his only son. Nay, weep not so, resumed the child, But rather let me say, My own sad story, sin defiled, And why I die to-day. Picking a living in our sheaves, and happy in their loves, Near mid a people's quivering leaves there lived a pair of doves. Never were they two separate, and lo, in idle mood, I took a sling and ball elate, in wicked sport, and rude, And killed one bird, it was the male, oh, cruel deed and base! The female gave a plaintive wail, and looked me in the face. The wail! and sad reproachful look in plain words seem to say a widowed life i cannot brook the forfeit thou must pay what was my darling's crime that thou him wantonly shouldst kill the curse of blood is on thee now blood calls for red blood still and so i die a bloody death but not for this i mourn to feel the world pass with my breath i gladly could have borne but for my parents, who are blind and have no other stay, This, this, weighs sore upon my mind, and fills me with dismay. Upon the eleventh day of the moon, they keep a rigorous fast, All yesterday they fasted, soon for water and repast. They shall upon me feebly call, ah, must they call in vain? Bear thou the pitcher, friend, tis all I ask, down that steep lane. He pointed, ceased, then suddenly died. The king took up the corpse, and with the pitcher slowly hid, attended by remorse. Down the steep lane unto the hut, girt round with bela trees, gleamed far a light, the door not shut, was open to the breeze. Oh, why does not our child return? Too long he surely stays. Thus to the moony, blind and stern, his partner gently says, For fruits and water when he goes, he never stays so long. Oh, can it be, beset by foes, he suffers cruel wrong? Some distance he has gone, I fear, a more circuitous round. Yet why should he? The fruits are near, the river near our bound. I die of thirst, it matters not, if Sindhu be but safe. What if he leaves us and this spot, poor birds in cages chafe? Peevish and fretful oft we are, ah no, that cannot be. Of our blind eyes he is the star, without him, what were we? Too much he loves us to forsake, but something ominous, here in my heart a dreadful ache, says he is gone from us. Why do my bowels for him yearn? What ill has crossed his path? Blind helpless, whither shall we turn, or how avert the wrath? Lord of my soul, what means my pain, this horrid terror like? Some cloud that hides the hurricane, hang not, O lightning, strike. Thus while she spake, the king drew near, with haggard look and wild, weighed down with grief and pale with fear, bearing the lifeless child rustled the dry leaves neath his foot and made an eerie sound a neighbouring owl began to hoot all else was still around at the first rustle of the leaves the moony answered clear lo here he is o oh, wherefore grieves thy soul my partner dear the words distinct the monarch heard he could no further go 
his nature to its depths was stirred he stopped in speechless woe no steps advanced the sudden pause attention quickly drew rolled sightless orbs to learn the cause but hark the steps renew where art thou darling why so long hast thou delayed to-night we die of thirst we are not strong this fasting kills outright speak to us dear one only speak and calm our idle fears where hast thou been and what to seek have pity on these tears with head bent low the monarch heard then came a cruel throb that tore his heart still not a word only a stifled sob it is not sindhu who art thou and where is sindhu gone there's blood upon thy hands avow there is speak on speak on the dead child in their arms he placed and briefly told his tale the parents their dead child embraced and kissed his forehead pale our hearts are broken come dear wife on earth no more we dwell now welcome death and farewell life and thou o king farewell we do not curse thee god forbid but to my inner eye the future is no longer hid thou too shalt like us die die for a son's untimely loss die with a broken heart now help us to our bed of moss and let us both depart upon the moss he laid them down and watched beside the bed death gently came and placed a crown upon each reverend head where the sarayu's waves dash free against a rocky bank the monarch had the corpses three conveyed by men of rank there honoured he with royal pomp their funeral obsequies incense and sandal drum and tromp and solemn sacrifice what is the sequel of the tale how died the king o oh man a prophet's words can never fail go read the ramayan End of section 11section twelve of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this has been read by roslyn carlyle ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt pralad a terror both of gods and men was Hiron Kashyap, the king. No bear more sullen in its den, no tiger quicker at the spring. In strength of limb he had not met, since first his black flag he unfurled, nor in audacious courage yet, his equal in the wide, wide world. The holy Vils he tore in shreds, libations sacrifices rites he made all penal and the heads of brahmins slain he flung to kites i hold the sceptre in my hand i sit upon the ivory throne bow down to me tis my command and worship me and me alone no god has ever me withstood why raise ye altars cease your pains i shall protect you give you food if ye obey, or else the chains. Fled at such edicts, self-exiled, the Brahmins and Pundits wise, to live thenceforth in forests wild, or caves in hills that touch the skies. In secret there they altars raised, and made oblations due by fire. Their gods, their wanted gods, they praised, lest these should earth destroy in ire. They read the vils, they prayed and mused, full well they knew that time would bring, for favours scorned and gifts misused, undreamt of changes on his wing. Time changes deserts bare to meads, and fertile meads to deserts bare, cities to pools, and pools with reeds, to towns and cities large and fair. Time changes purple into rags, and rags to purple chime by chime whether it flies or runs or drags the wise wait patiently on time time brought the tyrant children four rad 
Onurad, Pralad, Sungrad, who made his castle grey and hoar, once full of gloom with sunshine glad. No boys were e'er more beautiful, no brothers e'er loved more each other, no sons were e'er more dutiful, nor ever kissed a fonder mother. Nor less beloved were they of him, who gave them birth, Kashyap proud, but made by nature stern and grim, his love was covered by a cloud, from which it rarely e'er emerged, to gladden these sweet human flowers. They grew apace, and now time urged the education of their powers. Who should their teacher be, a man among the flatterers in the court, was found well suited to the plan. The tyrant had devised. Report gave him a wisdom owned by few, and certainly to trim his sail and veer his bark none better knew before a changing adverse gale. And Sonda Marco, such his name, took home the four fair boys to teach all knowledge that their years became, science and war and modes of speech. But he was told, if death he feared, never to tell them of the soul, of vows and prayers and rites revered, and of the gods who all control. The sciences the boys were taught, they mastered with a quickness strange, but Pralad was the one for thought, he soared above the lesson's range. One day the tutor unseen heard, the boy discuss forbidden themes, as if his inmost heart were stirred, and he of truth from heaven had gleams. O oh, prince, what meanst thou? In his fright the teacher thus in private said, Talk on such subjects is not right. Wouldst thou bring ruin on my head? There are no gods except the king, the ruler of the world is he. Look up to him, and do not bring destruction by a speech too free. Be wary for thy own sake, child. If he should hear thee talking so, thou shalt for ever be exiled, and I shall die, full well I know. Worthy of worship, honour, praise, is thy great father. Things unseen, what are they? Themes of poets' lays, they are not, and have never been. Smiling, the boy with folded hands, as sign of a submission meek, answered his tutor, thy commands are ever precious do not seek to lay upon me what i feel would be unrighteous let me hear those inner voices that reveal long vistas in another sphere the gods that rule the earth and sea shall i abjure them and adore a man it may not may not be though i should lie in pools of gore my conscience i would hurt no more but i shall follow what my heart tells me is right so i implore my purpose fixed no longer thwart. The coward calls black white, white black, at bidding or in fear of death. Such suppleness, thank God, I lack. To die is but to lose my breath. Is death annihilation? No. New worlds will open on my view. When persecuted hence I go. The right is right, the true is true. All's over now, the teacher thought. Now let this reach the monarch's ear. An instant death shall be my lot. They parted he in abject fear. And soon he heard a choral song, Sung by young voices, In the praise of gods unseen, Who right all wrong and rule the worlds From primal days. What progress have thy charges made? Let them be called, that I may see. And Sonda Marco brought as bade His pupils to the royal knee. Three passed the monarch's test severe, the fourth remained, then spake the king. Now, Pralad, with attention here, I know thou hast the strongest wing. What is the cream of knowledge, child, which men take such great pains to learn? With folded hands he answered mild. Listen, O sire, to speak I yearn. All sciences are nothing worth astronomy that tracks the star, geography that maps the earth, logic and politics and war and medicine that strives to heal but only aggravates disease all all are futile so i feel for me o oh father none of these that is true knowledge which can show the glory of the living gods divest of pride make men below humble and happy though but clods 
That is true knowledge which can make us mortals saint-like, holy, pure, the strange thirst of the spirit's lake, and strengthen suffering to endure. That is true knowledge which can change our very natures with its glow. The sciences, whate'er their range, feed but the flesh and make a show. Where hast thou learnt this nonsense, boy? Where live these gods, believed so great? Can they, like me, thy life destroy? Have they such troops and royal state? Above all gods is he who rules the wide, wide earth from sea to sea. Men, devils, gods, here, all but fools. Bow down in fear and worship me. And dares an atom from my loins against my kingly power rebel? Though heaven itself to aid him joins, his end is death, the infidel. I warn thee yet. Bow down, thou slave, and worship me, or thou shalt die. We'll see what gods descend to save, what gods with me their strength will try. Thus spake the monarch in his ire, one hand outstretched in menace rude, and eyes like blazing coals of fire, and Prahlad in unruffled mood. Straight answered him, his head bent low, his palms joined meekly on his breast, as ever, and his cheeks aglow, his rock firm purpose to attest. Let not my words, sire, give offence to thee and to my mother both. I give as due all reverence, and to obey thee am not loath, but higher duties sometimes clash with lower, then these last must go, or there will come a fearful crash in lamentation, fear, and woe. The gods who made us are the life of living creatures, small and great. We see them not, but space is rife, with their bright presence and their state. They are the parents of us all. Tis they create, sustain, redeem, heaven, earth, and hell they doth hold and thrall. And shall we these high gods blaspheme? Blessed is the man whose heart obeys, and makes their law of life his guide. He shall be led in all his ways, his footsteps shall not ever slide. In forests dim, on raging seas, in certain peace shall he abide. What though he all the world displease, his gods shall all his wants provide. Cease, babbler, tis enough. I know thy proud rebellious nature well. Huh, captain of our lifeguards, huh, take down this lad to dungeon cell and bid the executioner wait our orders. All unmoved and calm he went, as reckless of his fate, erect and stately as a palm. Hushed was the hall, as down he passed, no breath, no whisper, not a sign, through ranks of courtiers all aghast, like beaten hounds that dare not whine. Outside the door the captain spoke, Recant, he said beneath his breath, the lion's anger to provoke is death, O Prince, is certain death. Thanks, said the Prince, I have revolved the question in my mind with care. Do what you will, I am resolved to do the right, all deaths I dare. The gods, perhaps, may please to spare my tender years. If not, why, still, I never shall my faith forswear. I can but say, be done their will. Whether in pity for the youth, the headsman would not rightly ply the weapon or the gods in truth, had ordered that he should not die. Soon to the king there came report, the sword would not destroy his son. The council held thereon was short, the kings looked frightened, every one. There is a spell against cold steel, which known the steel can work no harm. Some sycophant with baneful zeal, hath taught this foolish boy the charm. It would be wise, O king, to deal some other way, or else I fear, much damage to the common wheel. Thus spake the wily-tongued vizier. Dark frowned the king. Enough of this! Death, instant death, is my command. Go throw him down some precipice, or bury him alive in sand. With terror dumb from that wide hall, departed all the courtier band. But not one man amongst them all dared raise against the prince's hand. 
and now vague rumours ran around men talked of them with bated breath the river has a depth profound the elephants trample down to death the poisons kill the firebrands burn had every means in turn been tried some said they had but soon they learn the brave young prince had not yet died for once more in the council hall he had been cited to appear twas open to the public hall and all the people came in fear banners were hung along the wall the king sat on his peacock throne and now the hoary marical brings in the youth bare skin and bone who shall protect thee pralad now against steel poison water fire thou art protected men avow who treason if but bold admire in our own presence thou art brought that we and all may know the truth where are thy gods i long have sought but never found them hapless youth will they come down to prove their strength will they come down to rescue thee let them come down for once at length come one or all to fight with me where are they gods or are they dead or do they hide in craven fear there lies my gauge none ever said i hide from any far or near my gracious liege my sire my king if thou indeed wouldst deign to hear in humble mood my words would spring like a pellucid fountain clear for i have in my dungeon dark learnt more of the truth than e'er i knew there is one god only one mark to him is all our surface due hath he a shape or hath he none i know not this nor care to know dwelling in light to which the sun is darkness he sees all below himself unseen in him i trust he can protect me if he will and if this body turn to dust he can new life again instill i fear not fire i fear not sword all dangers father i can dare alone i can confront a horde for oh my god is everywhere what everywhere then in this hall and in this crystal pillar bright now tell me plain before us all is he herein the god of light the monarch placed his steel-gloved hand upon a crystal pillar near in mockful jest was his demand the answer came low serious clear yes father god is even here and if he choose this very hour can strike us dead with ghastly fear and vindicate his name and power where is this god now let us see he spumed the pillar with his foot down down it tumbled like a tree severed by axes from the root and from within with horrid clang that froze the blood in every vein a stately sable warrior sprang like some phantasma of the brain he had a lion head and eyes a human body feet and hands colossal such strange shapes arise in clouds when autumn rules the lands he gave a shout the boldest quailed then struck the tyrant on the helm and ripped him down and last he hailed prelad as king of all the realm a thunder clap the shape was gone one king lay stiff and stark and dead another on the peacock throne bowed reverently his youthful head loud rang the trumpets louder still a sovereign's people wild acclaim the echoes ran from hill to hill kings rule for us and in our name tyrants of every age and clime remember this that awful shape shall startle you when comes the time and send its voice from cape to cape as human peoples suffer pain but oh the lion strength is theirs woe to the king when gals the chain woe woe their fury when he dares end of section 12section thirteen of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt read for librivox.org 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This poem has been read by Rosalind Carlyle. Sita Three happy children in a darkened room. What do they gaze on with wide open eyes? A dense, dense forest where no sunbeam pries, and in its centre a cleared spot. There bloom gigantic flowers on creepers that embrace tall trees. There, in a quiet, lucid lake, the white swans glide. There, whirring from the brake, the peacock springs. There, herds of wild deer race there patches gleam with yellow waving grain there blue smoke from strange altars rises light there dwells in peace the poet anchorite but who is this fair lady not in vain she weeps for lo at every tear she sheds tears from three pairs of young eyes fall amain Unbowed in sorrow are the three young heads. It is an old, old story, and the lay which has evoked sad Sita from the past is by a mother sung. Tis hushed at last, and melts the picture from their sight away. Yet shall they dream of it until the day, when shall those children by their mother's side gather, ah me, as erst at eventide. End of section 13section 14 of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this section has been read by rosling carlyle Near Hastings Near Hastings, on the shingle beach, We loitered at the time, When ripens on the wall the peach, The autumn's lovely prime. Far off the sea and sky seemed blent, The day was wholly done, The distant town its murmurs sent, Strangers, we were alone. We wandered slow, sick, weary, faint, Then one of us sat down, no nature hers to make complaint the shadows deep and brown a lady passed she was not young but oh her gentle face no painter poet ever sung or saw such saint-like grace she passed us then she came again observing at a glance that we were strangers one in pain then asked were we from france we talked a while, some roses red, that seemed as wet with tears. She gave my sister, and she said, God bless you both, my dears. Sweet were the roses, sweet and full, and large as lotus flowers, that in our own wide tanks we cool, to deck our Indian bowers. But sweeter was the love that gave those flowers to one unknown. I think that he who came to save the gift a debt will own, the lady's name I do not know, her face no more may see, but yet, oh yet, I love her so, blessed happy may she be, her memory will not depart, though grief my years should shade, still bloom her roses in my heart, and they shall never fade. End of section 14 Section 15 of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt Read for LibriVox.org All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This poem has been read by Rosalind Carlyle. France, 1870 Not dead, oh no, she cannot die only a swoon from loss of blood levite england passes her by help samaritan none is nigh who shall stanch me this sanguine flood 
range the brown hair it blinds her e'en dash cold water over her face drowned in her blood she makes no sign give her a draught of generous wine none heed none hear to do this grace head of the human column thus ever in swoon wilt thou remain thought freedom truth quenched ominous whence then shall hope arise for us plunged in the darkness all again no she stirs there's a fire in her glance where oh where of that broken sword what dare ye for an hour's mischance gather around her jeering france attila's own exultant horde lo she stands up stands up e'en now strong once more for the battle fray gleams bright this star that from her brow lightens the world bow nations bow let her again lead on the way end of section fifteen section sixteen of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this section has been read by rosling carlyle the tree of life broad daylight with a sense of weariness mine eyes were closed but i was not asleep my hand was in my father's and i felt his presence near me thus we often passed in silence hour by hour what was the need of interchanging words when every thought that in our hearts arose was known to each and every pulse kept time suddenly there shone a strange light and the scene as sudden changed i was awake it was an open plain illimitable stretching stretching oh so far and o'er it that strange light a glorious light like that the stars shed over fields of snow in a clear cloudless frosty winter night only intenser in its brilliance calm and in the midst of that vast plain i saw for i was wide awake it was no dream a tree with spreading branches and with leaves of diverse kinds dead silver and live gold shimmering in radiance that no words may tell beside the tree an angel stood he plucked a few small sprays and bound them round my head oh the delicious touch of those strange leaves no longer throbbed my brows no more i felt the fever in my limbs and oh i cried bind to my father's forehead with these leaves one leaf the angel took and therewith touched his forehead and then gently whispered nay never oh never had i seen a face more beautiful than that angel's or more full of holy pity and of love divine wondering i looked a while then all at once opened my tear-dimmed eyes when lo the light was gone the light is of the stars when snow lies deep upon the ground no more no more was seen the angel's face i only found my father watching patiently by my bed and holding in his own close pressed my hand end of section sixteen Section seventeen of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This section has been read by Rosling Carlyle. On the flyleaf of Erkman Chatrian's novel entitled Madame Therese. Wavered the foremost soldiers, then fell back fallen was their leader and loomed right before the sullen prussian cannon grim and black with lighted matches waving now once more patriots and veterans ah tis in vain back they recoil though bravest of the brave 
no human troops may stand that murderous rain but who is this that rushes to a grave it is a woman slender tall and brown she snatches up the standard as it falls in her hot haste tumbles her dark hair down and to the drummer boy aloud she calls to beat the charge then forwards on the pont they dash together who could bear to see a woman and a child thus death confront nor burn to follow them to victory i read the story and my heart beats fast well might all europe quail before thee france battling against oppression years have passed yet of that time men speak with moistened glance va nous pien when rose high your marseillaise man knew his rights to earth's remotest bound and tyrants trembled yours alone the praise ah had a washington but then been found end of section seventeen Section 18 of Ancient Ballads and Legends of Hindustan by Toru Dutt. Read for LibriVox.org. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This poem has been read by Rosling Carlyle. Sonnet Vagmari A sea of foliage girds our garden round, but not a sea of dull and varied green sharp contrasts of all colours here are seen the light green graceful tamarinds abound amid the mango clumps of green profound and palms arise like pillars grey between and o'er the quiet pools the simuls lean red red and startling like a trumpet's sound but nothing can be lovelier than the ranges of bamboos to the eastward when the moon looks through their gaps and the white lotus changes into a cup of silver one might swoon drunken with beauty then or gaze and gaze on a primeval eden in a maze end of section eighteen section nineteen of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru Dutt read for librivox .org. all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. this poem has been read by rosling carlyle sonnet the lotus love came to flora asking for a flower that would of flowers be undisputed queen the lily and the rose long long had been rivals for that i honour bards of power had sung their claims the rose can never tower like the pale lily with her juno mia but is the lily lovelier thus between flower factions rang the strife in sykes's bower give me a flower delicious as the rose and stately as the lily in her pride but of what colour rose red love first chose then pray no lily white or both provide and flora gave the lotus rose red dyed and lily white the queenliest flower that blows end of section nineteen section twenty of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru Dutt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This section has been read by Roslyn Carlyle. Our Cashuarina Tree Like a huge python winding round and round, the rugged trunk indented deep with scars, up to its very summit near the stars, a creeper climbs in whose embrace is bound no other tree could live but gallantly the giant wears the scarf and flowers are hung in crimson clusters all the boughs among whereon all day are gathered bird and bee and oft at night the garden overflows with one sweet song that seems to have no close 
sung darkling from our tree while men repose when first my casement is wide open thrown at dawn my eyes delighted on it rest sometimes and most in winter on its crest a grey baboon sits statue-like alone watching the sunrise while on lower boughs his puny offspring leap about and play and far and near coquillas hail the day and to their pastures wind our sleepy cows and in the shadow on the broad tank cast by that hoar tree so beautiful and vast the water lilies spring like snow in mast but not because of its magnificent dear is the casuarina to my soul beneath it we have played though years may roll oh sweet companions loved with love intense for your sakes shall the tree be ever dear blent with your images it shall arise in memory till hot tears blind mine eyes what is that dirge-like murmur that i hear like the sea breaking on a shingle beach it is the tree's lament an eerie speech that haply to the unknown land may reach unknown yet well known to the eye of faith ah i have heard that wail well far far away in distant lands by many a sheltered bay when slumbered in his cave the water wraith and the waves gently kissed the classic shore of france or italy beneath the moon when earthly tranced in a dreamless swoon and every time the music rose before mine inner vision rose a form sublime thy form o tree as in my happy prime i saw thee in my own love native clime therefore i fain would consecrate a lay unto thy honour tree beloved of those who now in blessed sleep for i repose dearer than life to me alas were they mayst thou be numbered when my days are done with deathless trees like those in borrowdale under whose awful branches lingered pale fear trembling hope and death the skeleton and time the shadow and though weak the verse that would thy beauty fain o oh, fain rehearse may love defend thee from oblivion's curse end of section twenty end of ancient ballads and legends of hindustan by toru dutt